All right, welcome to Hoops Tonight here at The Volume. Happy Tuesday, everybody. Hope all of you guys are having a great week. We got a very special guest today, senior NBA writer at Sports Illustrated, one of our colleagues here at The Volume as well. Mr. Chris Mannix is going to be joining the show to break down the Boston Celtics and then talk a little bit uh, about the league at large in season tournament where he's at with contenders and things along those lines. Chris, I appreciate you making time to hop on the show. This is where I want to start today. So obviously when it comes to the Celtics, it's so annoying to talk about them because they're so good that like it's difficult to frame the conversation properly from the standpoint of like they've been the second best team in the league this year by win percentage and they've played by far the hardest schedule. So like they're clearly awesome. But then there are like these kind of discouraging moments where it's like they go and they fail a big test in Minnesota or like last week against Indiana where their offense kind of stalls out down the stretch and like Tatum gets Halliburton on a couple of switches and he just waits for the clock to run out and takes a tough contested jumper or he's isolating Aaron Neesmith on a cleared side and he can't really quite get a great advantage and their offense kind of stalls out. They had a 112.5 offensive rating in clutch time versus Indiana. Couldn't get a stop on the other end. And they lost. So at this point, are you worried at all about the Celtics and the same late game offense issues that we've been hearing discussed over the last few years? And was Indiana a concern at all within the locker yeah, room? Yeah, I, I wouldn't use the word worried yet about the Celtics. I still think they are as good as it comes with the top six in the NBA. Um, and there's still a lot to like about this team, right? Like when they're on, they're great offensively. They're great defensively. I think they're one of three teams in the NBA that are top 10 in offensive, defensive, and net rating. So I, I th there's just too much to like to be concerned. There are some things that that absolutely need to be ironed out. You mentioned fourth quarter execution. Uh, from my vantage point, I'd like to see them run more offense through Jason Tatum in the fourth quarter. They have been kind of spread the wealth in, in some of those situations. And I think Tatum, when it, it comes playoff time, He's going to be the guy like you're going to need him to take over games. I'd like to see them trend more in that direction late in games where it's finding, you know, ways for him to isolate mismatches, things like that. That's something I'd like to see the coaching staff get more creative with. One of the problems, though, they've had all season has been third quarters. Third quarter has been a disaster for Boston. They're one of the worst third quarter teams in the NBA and Indiana was a great example of that. They had a seven point lead going into the locker room at halftime of that game. They were down like eight or nine or whatever it was uh, beginning of the fourth quarter. That's not an aberration. That's been a trend. And, you know, when you see that, you think the energy isn't right coming out of the locker room, which has been a problem for this team in the past. And you think coaching adjustments, because that's when the coaching staff for both teams makes the adjustments that they're going to make, uh, you know, for the second half. So that to me is a bigger area of concern right now. The fact that this team has been so bad uh, in third quarters during this season, uh, when you get to the playoffs, that's something that you have to be, you know, be straight with. Yeah, I remember checking at, at during that third quarter against Indiana, and I looked at, um, I ended up looking at the just the the third quarter net rating, and I think they were like twenty ninth really in the bad. NBA or yeah. something like that. It, it was, it was really bad. I think, I think the thing for me personally that's kind of discouraging, and I understand the the reason why because I, I I've I've seen this with basketball teams a lot where like they're almost too good to the point where it, it makes them sometimes a little lazy on offense. And what I mean by that is like. Like these guys work really hard on a lot of really tough shots. And so sometimes they find themselves in a situation where they can make a shot and they'll take it rather than being a little more, a little bit more deliberate to get a great shot. So to give you an example, like if I, if I told you that you had a team that I think we, I think you, let me just ask you this straight up. Do you think the Celtics have the best combination of ball handling, shooting and passing in the NBA? Ooh, I mean, like down the roster, like in just total number of guys that are skilled offensive yeah, players. Yeah, because you you at least the top six that they're playing, and, and we can get into seven and eight, which I think is a a, a point of concern mm. for this team. At least top six, you know, whether it's big or small, they're all good ball handlers, playmakers, three point shooters. So yeah, I would say the answer is yes. Yeah, and see, that's what's kind of discouraging to me. It, you, that group should be better than seventh in offensive rating. And there's a couple of specific things that stand out to me. For one, they take a ton of pull-up jump shots. They take 21 of them a game, which is eighth 
in the NBA, yet they only get 0.93 points per shot, which is 17th in the NBA for that shot type. Uh, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown alone take 13 pull-up jump shots a game, and both of them are not nearly as efficient on that shot for what you would like. Like what, it, This is not a Tyrese Halliburton pull-up jump shot or a Steph Curry pull-up jump shot where you're getting well over a point per possession. And, and then deeper down uh, the list of concern for me, that like kind of willingness for both of those guys to to kind of settle at the start of possessions has led them to be 23rd in assists per 100 possessions. And so my thing is like, I think the idealized version of this team is one that is a little bit more predicated on ball movement, rim pressure through slashing and making really good rim decisions for wide open threes and layups at the rim. It's because at this point, like, I think I think if this team's going to win the title, they have to be better offensively than they have been to this point. Would you agree? Yeah. Um, to to expand on that, I I think at times they get way too bogged down in three point shooting. I mean, the pull up jump shots are are bad for sure. Um, but, but they are the definition of live by the three and die by the three. I mean, this year they're sixteen and one this season when they're shooting forty three and a half percent or better from three point range. Zero and four when they're shooting anything less than that. So. You know, the way that they leaned in to the three-point shooting this year, really going full Missoula ball. Like, you know, last year they still had an offense or a team that was built to play a system that Ime Udoka uh, was comfortable with. This year, because of what we saw at the end of last year where Joe Missoula was just encouraging threes at all times of the game, they've leaned all the way into that with Porzingis now getting uh, a lot of minutes um, at that center position. So... I, you know, I think they all they do have some concerns about shot selection, whether it is those pull up jump shots or just their tendency to get, you know, way too committed to three point shots to will themselves back into games. And quick threes too, like like they take a lot of threes that are like good, not great yeah, threes. No, if do. that makes sense, and like I think that reflects in it. I think it reflects in their percentage too, because we we talked about this earlier, and you and I agree, like. I think I think Derek White's an excellent three point shooter. Jason Tatum's an excellent three point shooter. Jalen Brown is an excellent three point shooter. But they kind of ram their own percentages down with that shot selection. As a team, they're 18th in percentage, which really shouldn't be the case for the level of talent that they have on that roster. And like specifically at the end of games, and and you you had mentioned this, and I 100 percent agree with you. The running the offense more through Tatum because they're 13th in clutch offensive rating, and that was another thing that popped up against Indiana, like we mentioned earlier. And one of the things I noticed down the stretch that Indiana game is they kept trying to get switches off to get Tatum off of Neesmith, but they were using him as the screener. And so one of the things that Neesmith was able to do was just hug up on Tatum. And they know Derek White's looking to pass because Derek White wants to get the ball back to Tatum. And so then all of a sudden it would just end up with Neesmith on Tatum again. And then he'd be taking some tough contested long jump shot. One of the things I'd like to see him do is put Tatum on the ball and have Derek White Mm. set the screen. Because then in that situation, if they if they don't hedge or show or switch in any way, shape, or form, Tatum can get downhill, and that's where his passing ability can become an advantage. And then if, for whatever reason, they both show on him, now Derek White could be wide open. And, and it's just, they're going to overreact to Tatum in both ends of that action. And so it doesn't make sense for him to not have the ball. And then also, and I'm sure you'd agree with this, but I think Porzingis being out there would help a lot because... In those pick and pop situations, they're just going to uh, be in a drop coverage waiting for Tatum at the rim. And Porzingis is going to get wide open catches at the top of the key where he can kind of get the the defense into rotation better. And it's worth mentioning, Porzingis has has, uh, played in just 483 out of 1,018 minutes this year. And he's been one of their best on-off guys. Like if you look at the on-off numbers, two of the guys that stand out pretty quickly are Derek White, and Kristaps Porzingis. And it makes sense to me because Porzingis is such a great entry point for them offensively. And then Derek White is like their most gifted, like all around offensive guard, you know, with his ability to pass and and to shoot the ball. But like, I I think you hit the nail on the head. Like they absolutely have to uh, revamp some things with their late game offense and lean on Tatum more. If for no other reason than the reps that he needs to be, to be able to handle that down the line where overall with Jason Tatum's development, like here, I guess he turns 26 in March. So we're, we're getting into like, I think you could comfortably say he's in his prime. Right. So like, uh, where are you at overall with his development at this point? I think it's been excellent that, you know, look, you see strides that, Tatum is making 
every single year. Um, you look at this year, he's shooting something like 74% at shots at the rim. That's a great number for Jason Tatum. His mid-range game, I believe, is still right around 50%. That's a great number for Jason Tatum. He's about it's above 60% on drive to the basket. That was a real point of emphasis for Jason Tatum and the people around him this offseason. He shot, I think, 38% on drives during the 2022 playoffs when they made that run to the finals. After that, they were locked in on trying to improve that part of his game. The fact that he's above... 60%, which is like Halliburton territory, LeBron James territory. Uh, that speaks volumes about Jason Tatum's development as a player. I mean, the, the, the critique of Tatum that I've seen recently, and you can go back to that Indiana game, when he did get the matchups that he wanted, specifically on Halliburton, they wanted him defended by Halliburton. In the first half, he was taken to the basket. The second half, he was pulling up for three. You're doing Tyrese Halliburton a favor if you're taking a, a half-contested three-point jump shot in a situation like that. I want to see him going to the basket, getting to the free throw line, which he's done a nice job of at this year. You know, that to me is is the strength of Jason Tatum's game right now. Yeah, he has improved so much at the rim. It's ridiculous. Like, it's night and day from where he was a couple of years ago. The post-up stuff has been really interesting. There have been 18 players this year that have run at least 75 post-ups. His 1.1 points per possession, including passes, ranks fourth out of that those That was another, another point of, of fact, emphasis for him this offseason. Like, they, they saw their weaknesses. You know, him and the guys around him, Drew Hanlon, his longtime trainer, they saw these weaknesses and and they were determined to fix them. And the post-ups was something that they wanted to get better at. Improving the mid-range percentage was something they wanted to get better at. And, you know, th those drives to the basket. I mean, Jason Tatum, you know, the last couple of years has grown into his man strength. They want him using that to get to the rim, get to the free throw line, and to score at a high percentage. And he's doing that this season. Well, it's it's he's going to need that when they get to the postseason. That that was that's been one of the things specifically, especially as he's gotten so much stronger. It's just going to be something that's that he can lean on. And like like that that's that's what's crazy. Like when you're looking at those post up guys, like it's Jokic number one, Siakam who's been excellent this year in the post, Anthony Davis, and then Tatum. Like it's kind of weird to even see his name in those types of lists. I I would say oh, one other wild stat about Tatum in the post. Uh, uh, when he shoots out of the post, he draws a foul 29% of the time. <laughs> that is absolutely they, look, crazy. They think that he but, can be, uh, the one, you know, eventually they believe that Tatum's ability to be a creator out of that spot is going to be valuable for them because double teams are going to have to come if he's scoring at an efficient rate out of that post. And they believe he's got it in him to be a solid playmaker in those types of situations, which unlock other things within that offense. And that, that specifically was what he did at the end of the Miami Heat series that kind of turned things around for them. It was cleared side post-ups and isos, where basically it simplifies his reads and his ability to see the floor and kind of allows him to use his strength. And like, honestly, the the one, the because you, you hit the, the rim finishing, uh, oh, his assists are down a little bit, but I think that more has to do with Drew Holiday coming in and just more... Uh, a diversity of shot creation in general with the team. Like he's just not heliocentric. So he's not going to put up six, seven assists a game. I still think Tatum's a very gifted passer, but like all of this good there, the one thing is again, the pull-up jump shot, which is crazy because to start the year, he was red hot. <laughs> like he was making everything, but he's cooled way off. He's at 43% in effective field goal percentage on pull-up jump shots. That's 0 0.86 points per shot. He was 42% last year. He's taken seven, uh, seven of them a game. He's in the 36th percentile for his volume around the league. So for me, like again, it it's really this simple. Tatum's good is now good enough to do the job and to get this team over the top. It's can he, as a matter of discipline, kind of cut out some of the bad, which is like, Will he have the discipline in a game five in Indiana 2-2 two -two, has Halliburton on a switch with a cleared side to rip through to the baseline, turn his back and back him down and make a powerful move towards the basket or draw a double team and make a play out of it? Like, will he have that level of discipline? Because we know he can. It's just a question of, of whether or not he will. But before we move on to the the rest, uh, to some big picture stuff, I wanted to kind of get your pulse on the Drew and Kristaps acquisition so far. So let, let's start with Drew Holiday. How do you think his fit's been so far with the Celtics? Through I think it's been really season? good. Um, look, his shooting numbers continue to concern me because it's 
something of a continuation of a trend. Like his last year in Milwaukee, the numbers were worse than the year before. This year, I, I don't know exactly what they are right now, but you know, last time I checked, they were trending downward, and and, and that is is obviously something you want to watch as the season goes on. But if you're around that team, you know they they just can't stop singing his praises. Like just what he brings defensively, his versatility. I mean, he's defending power forwards most nights. Like you can put him, you know, it's kind of a cliche to go, you can guard, a, you can put a guy on one to five, but that's what, exactly what they're doing. You're seeing him on, you know, seven footers. You're seeing him on point guard. So, you know, that kind of versatility defensively has been invaluable. And the same thing with Porzingis. Like my concern with Porzingis was not his production because I did believe the way Boston move the ball that he would get opportunities maybe not the same volume of opportunities he got last year in washington but he would get opportunities and clean looks at the basket my concern has only been staying on the floor and look he's got the calf injury that's lingering right now hopefully you know you can put that behind him uh but this is a guy that's only played what 60 plus games three times in his nba career you know that worries me until he proves he can stay out there on the floor uh, that's going to be a concern for me. So I, I think Porzingis and and Holiday have been exactly what this team needed. What what they what worries me about this team when they get to the playoffs. And I said this at the start of the season. I feel like the Celtics were only six and a half guys deep, and I used Peyton Pritchard as kind of a half because I didn't know exactly what they were going to be able to get from. I still think that with the Celtics. Pritchard has been wildly inconsistent. Uh, Sam Hauser shooting the lights out of the ball, but you know what? Sam Hauser shot the lights out of the ball first half of last season too. I need to see it over a full season before I believe he's going to do it in the playoffs. The rest of those guys, like, you know, Joe Mazzulla is kind of mixing and matching guys that are in that, that rotation. Nobody's really stuck as of yet. I Look, I understand you tighten your rotation in the playoffs, but if you really have six guys that you trust, that that's that worries me when you get into a series against a team that's probably going to be able to play seven or eight. Yeah, the the Hauser thing's been interesting because like I actually think he's been pretty solid on defense too. Like as I, a see helper, the, I, I see like, the I see that and I see, but like I don't know, and, man. Like the team still hunt him. Like they still every every game I see, yeah, they're oh, still sure. hunting him down. For like sure. yeah, I, I get that the metrics say he's been a little bit better, but when I see teams like trying to get him on switches all the time and and attacking him, going through him, it just look I just everything with the Celtics. You have to view through the lens of a deep playoff run. And can you play Sam Hauser against Milwaukee in a second or third round series? I'm not yet convinced of it. I mean, look, I was on the Sam Hauser train last year. I mean, I was around this time of year calling Tony Bennett down in Virginia, writing a glossy profile on <laughs> Sam Hauser. Uh, and then he kind of fell off a cliff. The shot stopped falling. The defense wasn't there. And he was unplayable for that team in the postseason. Has that dramatically changed? Is there a significant difference in the Sam Hauser of this year than there was last year? Maybe there is, but I'm, you know, after kind of being a little bit burned on it, you know, after the start of last season, I need to see more of it before I'm going to buy it. I have this issue with Laker fans too, where it's like there's a difference between like an exciting story, like oh Max Christie yeah. showing some flashes of, of you know, and it's like can this dude play two shifts in the Western Conference Finals? Like it's a totally different a, a ball game when you get to that point. And I, I would agree with Sam Hauser, like it's an exciting story. He's got like he kind of fits that mold of like the Duncan Robinson, Michael Porter Jr., like elite weak side shooter that's got good length that could theoretically help and help defense situations and defensive rebounding. But it's like, do you trust him in that spot? I, I don't know. I think Drew's been interesting because I it, it's it's kind of classic Drew where like when he sticks to what he's good at, he's awesome. Like off ball, he's been excellent. He's been converting uh, spot up possessions at an extremely high rate, almost 1.3 points per possession. Obviously, you mentioned the defensive stuff, not just power forwards, but centers as well. Like he's doing everything for them defensively. It's his on ball stuff where like he can just go a little rogue sometimes and he hasn't been super efficient in those situations. I think Chris Porzingis has been like, like about as perfect a, a fit as you could possibly imagine. They are almost six points better per 100 possessions with him on the floor versus off. He's been one of the best role men in the league this year. 1.31 points per role man possession. That's fifth out of 23 players to run at least 50 possessions. These post-up stats are wild. 
1.64 points per post up, including passes on pretty decent volume. That's 98th percentile. And he really hasn't even shot the ball that well yet. Last year with the Wizards, a Porzingis jump shot was worth 1.1 points. This year, it's been worth 0.98. So I think he could even go up a level as a shooter. He's actually held up really well defensively, uh, not just in his drop coverages, but he's done really good on switches. He's been uh, an excellent switch defender this year. I think the Kristaps Porzingis thing has been a home run. And to your point about the depth, like they're in that weird spot now where it's like, if you could guarantee me all of those top six guys will be like ready to go, then I think they're fine. But there's very little margin for error there. And I would imagine the front office feels that way as well. So this is the, the before we get to the big picture. My last question I want to ask you is, do you think the Celtics will be active around the deadline at all? Or do you think this is a buyout team? Like, what, what, what do you look, what do you think in terms of in-season changes to the roster? I for think they'll team? be active. I believe they still have that Grant Williams trade exception that they can use some other, you know, salary cap vehicles that they can use. They still have some draft capital that they can deal. And one thing we've learned about Brad Stevens over the last few years, that he is a chips all in kind of guy with some of the moves he's made the last two seasons. He has not been shy about upgrading the roster. And it does sound, you know, my, my sense of what Celtics ownership has said to Brad Stevens is that like, if you can guarantee that the player we're acquiring is going to help us win at a higher level, we'll pay whatever you need. It's, it's guys that they acquire that wind up not turning out that way that irritate uh, the ownership uh, in Boston, which is understandable, uh, uh, of course. So, yeah, I think they'll be active. You know, the buyout market, it, it always just, the, the hype is never where it matches the substance. Remember last year, it's like Terrence Ross <laughs> is going to be this great signing. Everybody wants Terrence Ross. Dallas wants him. Phoenix wants him. Terrence Ross plays like, you know, like 10 minutes in the postseason. Like, it, it, you never yeah. you never really get it. Plus, this year with the buyout market, th there's like 13 teams in the West that are going to try to make a play-in run, you know, probably 10 or 11 uh, in the East, maybe 12, you're not going to get a robust buyout market when you have that many teams that are going to be competing for a playoff or a play-in spot. So I think their focus is going to be more on the trade market to try to get one more guy that is playable in the postseason, not somebody that can give them regular season minutes. They've got those guys. They can play, you know, Delano Blanton. They can play O'Shea Brissett. You can play Sam Howes. You can play Peyton Pritchard. You can go into your bench for Luke Cornett for regular season minutes, another guy that couldn't play in the playoffs last year. You can go into your bench for that, but you need a guy that you can trust for 15-ish minutes per game in the playoffs. That, I think, is the one piece the Celtics are missing right now. Yeah, during the regular season, that's one of the huge benefits of having those top six guys be mm -hmm. so damn good is like you can take any two of them and put three league average rotation end of the bench guys with them. And they're probably going to be a pretty good lineup because those top two are two of the top 50 or 60 players in the NBA. It's, it's a great luxury for this team. But to your point, you can't get away with that lineup in game five of the Eastern Conference Finals, which is kind of the point that you're trying to make. So let me ask you this then. If you had to pick a specific archetype of player that they would be targeting, what would it be? Oh, man. You know, my I would say... That well, it's twofold, right? I, I would want a scoring guard that can play multiple positions that can give you more than what Peyton Pritchard is giving you right now. Something like what Malcolm Brogdon was uh, for them last season, and before he got injured at the very end, Malcolm Brogdon had a phenomenal year in Boston. So they need something like that. I'm also a little concerned about that front court depth because to get to the finals you're probably going to have to go through a Milwaukee, Philadelphia, maybe even in New York, which has got great size and strength in that front court among some of the other teams that are out there. Uh, Al Horford in June, I think, is going to be, what, 38, is he? Like, he's he's getting up there in age. And Porzingis, mm -hmm. you, you know, look, he's been excellent, but an injury here, foul trouble there. And all of a sudden, you're dusting off Luke Cornett to play real minutes. And 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 that's <laughs> that's a lot to ask to have Luke Cornett matching up with, like, Bam Adebayo in real minutes or against any one of the three headed big man monster in Milwaukee with Giannis, Bobby Portis and Brooke Lopez. That, that to me is, is something uh, that's a concern. Look, the Celtics share that concern. I mean, it was just a couple of years ago that the Celtics were 
you know, all in on Jakob Pertl, you know, when Pertl was with the Spurs, like they were willing to go and give up a first round pick when Pertl was in the last year of his contract because they knew they needed front court depth going into the playoffs. And that was on a team that still had Grant Williams and had more depth and younger depth than Rob mm-hmm. Williams was, was still there. So, you know, one of those two things I think should be the part. They're good on the wing. You know, Tatum and Brown going to play 38 minutes a night. Nick can find uh, – you, you can deal with uh, any any uh, lack of depth on the bench there. But uh, you know, up front, muscle up front, a scoring guard in the backcourt, those are the two things I'd look at. Yeah, I think I I think I agree with you on both counts. Like w- one of the beautiful things about Derek White and Drew Holiday is they both can functionally yeah. operate as wings as well because of what they can do in terms of their strength for Drew Holiday and length for for Derek White. I think yeah, like an like a a reliable version of that Pritchard archetype. And then it's so hard to even tell what the center market's going to look like this year at the deadline just because you haven't heard too many names thrown out there. Yakupertl could be one of the guys that's available again. We'll have to see. Uh, but I'll, I'll, as as you know, the Raptors are not exactly an easy team to conduct business with. In the NBA, the game can change in an instant, but no matter how the action unfolds, DraftKings Sportsbook has your back. This week, new customers can score 150 instantly in bonus bets just for betting five bucks on basketball. Win or lose, you get an instant dub. They even have great same-game parlays. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code HOOPS. That's H-O-O-P-S. New customers can get 150 instantly in bonus bets for betting just $5 on basketball, only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code HOOPS. The crown is yours. Zooming out a little bit, as we look at the big picture, um, where do you, like, so I have like a, an inner circle group of contenders, seven teams for me, which is basically Denver, Boston, Lakers, Bucks, the uh, Timberwolves, Suns, and then I still kind of like, just dangling on by a thread. I have the Warriors just because if they make the right trade, you could put, you know, like if they got Siakam or something like that, you'd be like, you'd have to take them seriously. So where, where, what is your top tier of contenders look like right now? And where do you have the Celtics? Oh, they're in that top tier. I mean, if you're going to make a, a elite tier, you'd probably put Denver from the West in that group and then Milwaukee and Boston. Um, uh, Look, I'm a huge fan of, what Philadelphia is doing, but I'm going to need to see more of that in the playoffs. They're right there on the cut below in terms of finals teams that I, I'd, I'd trust, but you know, those, you know, Boston's right there, you know, in that mix, um, you know, Milwaukee's still very much a work in progress, but that's the kind of team I think is going to get better, you know, as Chris Middleton gets more time and more reps as, uh, you know, Damian Lillard gets more and more comfortable in that offense as he and Giannis get better and more proficient on the pick and roll. So I would still put Milwaukee uh, in that tier. Out West, to me, it's only Denver right now. I mean, the Clippers, the last 12 games are nine and three. So I'm keeping my eye on them, uh, you know, how they've played. They've been top mm. five in defensive efficiency during these last 12 games. So while the offense in LA is sorting itself out, the Clippers right now are playing great defense, especially uh, on the wing. So they're a team I'm keeping an eye on. But for right now, it's kind of Denver and everybody else in the Western Conference. Let's zoom in on the Bucks for a second. I um I thought that Pacers game was really concerning. Just from the standpoint of like they didn't even make Halliburton feel uncomfortable. And I tend to think that the uh, the, the point of attack stuff that we talked about before the season with them, we might have undersold that a little bit. And I didn't even like particularly the way the Celtics Bucks matchup looked like a few, what was that, about a month ago, uh, where it just was so obvious that Boston could make Dame work so much harder than Dame and Malik could make the Boston guards work. And I, I'm, I'm wondering, because like I've actually, so I have... I'm with you in the sense that I have Denver and Boston in my tier of like seven. I have Denver and Boston as like the clear top two and then like a small gap. And then I actually, after last week, put the Lakers above the Bucks just because I think that physically the Bucks have some major issues on the perimeter that are going to be a problem down the line. Are you, am I overplaying no. that a little bit in your opinion? Or do, no, like, do you because disagree? I mean, I, I like Malik Beasley. I don't know if Malik Beasley is a starting two guard on a finals team. Um, and I worry about how much they're playing him. I worry about Middleton holding up, you know, over the course of a season because he's really struggled with that over the last couple of years. Uh, I That Pacers loss was concerning, no question about it, especially when you have got 
you know, a player like Bobby Portis blowing up a little bit in the locker room, you know, afterwards and pointing the finger <laughs> in part at Adrian Griffin. Adrian Griffin to me is a wild card and all this. I mean, we spent all last year talking about Joe Missoula. You know, what kind of factor is he going to be in the Celtics postseason success? Well, you know, 20-ish games in, you have some of the same questions about Adrian Griffin. And I love Griff as an assistant coach. I love that he got the opportunity to be the head coach. But, you know, how the se- how the preseason started with Terry Stotts kind of getting broomed out of there pretty early, that was a concern for me because Terry Stotts was like the offensive czar of that team. You've watched this. Mm-hmm. They've changed their defenses up a few times you know, on the fly, they went from, you know, doing kind of that trapping pressure defense to going back that Budenholzer-esque drop coverage. So they're kind of, you know, experimenting. They're a work in progress right now. So, yeah, there there are some some legitimate concerns about Milwaukee. I, I just, maybe it's blind faith that I'm putting in, like Giannis to figure it out, Dame, who's still electric to figure it out, that front court to be enough of a deterrent at the rim offensively to overcome the obvious defensive problems that they have on the perimeter. Maybe I'm putting too much blind faith in some of the marquee guys on the roster, but I just believe when it comes to, you know, April and May, this team's going to be right. Yeah. I, it, it's tough because d- the other thing is Dame's not playing as well yeah. as he's capable of. He's like a, a he's a, he had another horrible shooting yeah, night last them. night. Yeah. He's like a healthy, yeah, he's a healthy 5% in effective field goal percentage down from what he was last year. I think there, you saw a little bit at the end of the Pacers game too, like some like who's, who should run the show here kind of thing going on where they're all kind of looking at each other and they don't know what to do. So I definitely think some of that stuff's going to get worked out, but I feel the same way about the bucks that I do with the Lakers, which is like, like, yeah, Malik Beasley shooting the shit out of the ball this year. Like whatever the Laker curse was, forget about that. Like he's making shots. All this stuff is great, but it's like, can he be the starting to on a championship team? Same thing with the Lakers. It's like, Oh, Cam Reddish, yeah. like career resuscitation, excellent point of attack defense. But it's like, like I just think of a Western Conference Finals game and I just think of Michael Porter Jr. completely ignoring Cam Reddish in the corner and basically just wrecking havoc as a 6'10 athlete around the rim and like that being a problem. And so for both of those teams, I view them as like if they make the right deal at the deadline and shore up that specific position to a better version of that player, I put them on the same tier with Boston and Denver. But until that point, it's just too much of a question mark. Um what did you uh, are you are you buying the Minnesota Timberwolves at all? They're the best team in the league to this point, but they're about to play just an absolutely brutal month of basketball. So who knows what it'll look like when we get in, in uh, into a month from now? But like they they've demonstrated a lot of high end potential this year. Are you buying them, or do you think it's well? Kind of fool's you're goal? right about the schedule. What's it? Fifteen straight games now against teams with a five hundred or re- better record or better coming up. On that schedule. And most yeah, of them on the road, on the too. Road. So we are going to learn mm. a lot about Minnesota over this next month. Um, I want to buy Minnesota. Like, I really do. Because, like, Mike Conley is one of the most likable guys in the NBA. And I love the surge he's having this year. Anthony Edwards is one of those guys that talks the talk and walks the walk. Or at least is doing it in the first half of this season. I love their versatility that they have defensively with Edwards and Jaden McDaniels and some of those guys said, look, I love that Rudy Gobert and Carl Anthony Towns have found a way to make it work. They've had 10 games this season where both of these guys have had double doubles. That's more than any duo has had in the same game uh, during, uh, during this season. So there's promising signs, but you know, one thing a coach said to me, um, before really right around the time that Gobert got traded, it was reiterated to me before the start of this season is that like at some point, Chris Finch may be faced with a decision where his best playoff lineup, his best closing playoff lineup will probably be one where either Carl Towns or Rudy Gobert is on the floor and not both. And does Chris Finch have it in him to sit like a 30 plus million dollar player on the bench for the final six minutes of that game. And I, look, I, I I think Chris Finch has done an incredible job because I was one of the people that were like wondering, would Tim Conley fire him at the end of last season comes back this year. and has really been a big part of their success, but I still need to see that. I still need to see if these two guys, Towns and Gobert can play together in late game situations, not be exploited by smart teams that have to only have to drill down on them for one series. So 
I, it's kind of a punt on that question, but like I want, I want to believe in Minnesota because I love the story. I love the way they've revived, uh, you know, the the this this team and this franchise after just a terrible season last year. But I still need to see more from the Gobert Towns front court before I make any conclusions. Yeah, it's it's matchup specific because like they're to me they're very similar to the Lakers in the sense that like they have this incredible combination of like excellent rim protector, excellent point of attack defenders, which was weird because we didn't expect that with the Lakers this year. Just Cam Reddish kind of appeared out of nowhere and kind of shored up that and they the the lineup configuration piece going away from two skill guards to one skill guard helped a lot. But like there it's a similar configuration there. The difference is is there will be teams at the top of the league that will view Mike Conley and Carl Town as entry mm. points and start to really find ways to exploit that. And so I, I am curious in the big picture, I kind of view them, I know this sounds outrageous to say because they've been a better regular season team to this point, but I just view them as a lesser version of the Lakers, which is like, will their half court offense be able to, and, and from a lineup construction standpoint, will they be able to put together groups of five players that they trust on both ends of the floor enough? And will they be able to execute in the half court? And I, it's just a big question mark for me. I definitely have them in my, in, in like my inner circle of contenders. I just have them further down They're fifth place I, you know, for well, me. I, I would now, say well, on, one go ahead. team we haven't talked about, and I, I'm going to go out to see him next week. Like where do we slot Oklahoma city right now? Because like what <laughs> they're just awesome. Like they have been awesome for almost the entire season. Shea Gildas Alexander is like an automatic 30 every single night. Chet Holmgren, they needed him to be a strong number two, and that's exactly what he's been. They've got a bunch of guys out there that can defend multiple positions. They're another one of those teams, top 10, I think, in offensive and defense efficiency, net rating. Like they, You try to find flaws with this team, and the only one that, that you can come up with really is that they're really young and maybe not ready for, for that type of moment. I mean, I mean, Casey Wallace comes in. Nobody thought Casey Wallace could shoot this level. He has, and he's defending. He's another guy that can defend with this group. I mean, I, I don't know where to put them right now because they've got a top five record in the NBA. They're playing great basketball. They only seem to lose to teams that are like on their level or better. Uh, I, <laughs> I'm starting to wonder when we have to take Oklahoma city seriously. We do have to take them seriously. I, I view them as like a, a serious upset threat, uh, specifically for s certain types of matchups, because like the youth thing that you mentioned is important. And that's obviously something you have to factor in in the postseason. Just everything about NBA history tells us young teams don't win. That's just that's just, you know, e even when we look at some of the old, younger teams that have had success, like the Thunder with Kevin Durant, there were veterans on that roster like Hendrick Perkins and Derek Fisher, as you know. So like th it's a little different. This is this roster does not have a veteran like they literally don't. You know what I mean? It's all young kids. Now, from a basketball standpoint, the big thing is they're just really small on the front line and they can't mm -hmm. defensive rebound. And so to me, to me, it really comes down to matchup specifics stuff. So like, for instance, they are one of the best perimeter defense teams in the league. So like if they ran into like a Golden State or like mm -hmm. a Phoenix where they're not going to be as bothered on the front line by some of the mismatches there, I could see them upsetting a team but i'd give them like almost no chance to beat minnesota denver or the lakers because of just the front, but, the but front like, what is like, you when, know what i mean and do they do something about that this year like that's the question i'm gonna try to drill down on in the next couple of like they've got all these assets they can't use all these draft picks well they know that they they probably can't pay all these guys because you know it, it, eventually the cost is going to become prohibitive like yeah, you know, I, I remember, you know, Sam Presti, who's, you know, preseason press conferences, I just record for hilarious sake because they're like an hour and a half long and he uses all these metaphors that take, you know, a, a long time to kind of interpret. But <laughs> I, I, it won't, it's like you've got all these pieces. Like, do you go out and get somebody? Like, you, do you, I don't, again, I don't know who that is at this point. The guys that are available that we know of right now are more like wing defenders. And that's not really what Oklahoma City needs, to your point at the moment. But like, is this a team that, that makes a big play. I mean, because even though like they're young, as I mentioned, you know, bottom four in terms of uh, age, but Shea's not young. Like Lou Dort's not young. Like they're young, you know, chronologically, but they've been around for a while and they look ready to do something there. Like, I, I don't know. I mean, that that's a team that, you know, if it wanted to get aggressive, it, you know, it might get to the trade deadline and realize it's a good time to do that. Yeah. Cause, well, cause Josh Giddy beyond yeah. the scandal just hasn't been playing very well.
Um, specifically, his on-ball stuff hasn't been very good, and their teams are really starting to ignore him off the ball as well, given him the whole Jared Vanderbilt mm-hmm. treatment, you know? And so I think, I think like, when I look at the idealized version of the team, it's Dort and Jalen Williams slotted up to the 2-3 rather than the 3-4. And so I almost look at it as, at it as like, Shea, Dort, Jalen a big forward to be named later and then Shed. And to me, like the, the team that I'd call, and it's going to be really hard because Danny Ainge is going to be like, I'll take <laughs> all of the picks. <laughs> but like, but like I, I'd be going after Laurie yeah. Markkinen because if you could get him, if you could get him, if you make a godfather offer there and like, and you're basically like, I get to put Shea with Laurie, with Chet, with Jalen Williams and, and Lou Dort. Now we're talking about a top tier contender. Does, in my does opinion. Kelly O'Linick so, do it? I'm for with you. Does I think Kelly O'Linick do it for you. Oh, I kind of I kind of like that. Man, and he's, he's experienced and he's more too. at this point than Lowry it, probably is. And he and, yeah, exactly. Like you could probably get him for wow, that's mm-hmm. actually that's super I think he's the guy that Danny, I like that I, I think he'd be first to go in Utah once they start kind of picking this thing apart. I mean, there'll be an appetite for him because he's, you know, a 6'10, 6'11 forward center that can shoot the ball and has that experience. But again, Oklahoma City can outbid pretty much everyone for anything. Uh that that would be a guy I'd keep an eye on. Yeah, well, and specifically slotting him next to a rim protector like mm-hmm. Walker Kessler, like a uh, Chet Holmgren. I mean, th- that's another guy I'd even be looking at for Indy to put next mm-hmm. to Miles Turner. That's super interesting. I'm going to keep uh, Kelly Olenek. That's 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 interesting. All right, before we get you out of here today, really quickly, what were your thoughts and major takeaways from the in season tournament? Just like the whole the whole like experience, and then did you learn anything from the basketball? I mean, in general, I loved it. If for no other reason than. I cared more about specific November, December basketball games this year than I did last year. Now, I know it's a lot more complicated than that. You know, the in-season tournament acolytes will say the ratings are up, the attendance is up. Um, everything, every metric you could want is up. But I'm kind of, I kind of lean towards that side of it all. The skeptics will say, yeah, it's up, but how much the NBA have to pay for it? Right. Like, you know, with all that yeah. the league put into it in terms of actual cash marketing, I mean, Michael Imperioli commercials. Like, Can you imagine how much those floors oh, were? Incredibly those expensive. floors have to have been outrageously I mean, they're, they're, they're expensive. Like it's, it, it's a lot. It's a lot of money. So <laughs> the NBA has invested a lot of cash into it. And I understand why. Like they're going to go to someone this offseason and say, we're going to sell the IST a la carte. And you and it's another way to create revenue for it. But I I, th- I would say it has been a success because, yes, the ratings were up. I, somebody from the NBA sent me a stat where it's like during in-season tournament games, the quote-unquote star players played in 90% of them or something like that. So they got, guy, they, they got what they wanted. They got star players playing in what would have otherwise been inconsequential NBA regular season games. So... I think to that end, it's a success. The, you know, will it would it be the same next year without all the marketing that's behind it, without all the promotion that's behind it, without all the commercializing that's behind it? I, I don't know the answer to that question, but I don't know how you can sit there and say anyone can sit there and say it's been any kind of flop or a failure. Uh, maybe it's a bit of a loss leader for the NBA because of how much money they had to spend, but overall, it generated interest in early season, regular season games, which when I talked to Adam Silver, when I talked to Evan Wash, when I talked to people inside the NBA about the ultimate goal of the in-season tournament, that is often at the top of the list. So if it accomplished that, I think it accomplished what it set out to overall. Yeah, I saw Ethan Strauss write a piece the other day talking about how people don't wrong. even realize he's how much of wrong. a flop yeah. it was. He's not, he's not wrong. The one thing I would say, though, is like, Rome yeah. wasn't built in a day, for lack of a better term. Like, this is the kind of thing that takes some momentum. I'll give you an example. There were, I want to say, three teams that went three and one in pool play games and did not get into the, uh, the to the knockout round. Point being, like, you know what I'm kind of excited for next year? I think that that was a, a good indicator of the fact that, like, even the four pool play games are basically single elimination. Like, they're, like it, it kind of adds these, like, 
the, so for all these teams, they're six to seven single elimination style games in November and December that adds a great deal of interest. And like in general, like LeBron winning and wanting to win it as bad as he did. I think that helps for the cachet of it all. And like, I think there's a version of this where 10 years from now, it is a type of tournament that is putting up, you know, a, a, a half of what you would expect from playoff games. I think I think it's like one of those things where it's way too soon to to look at it as a success or failure in the big picture. But I'll tell you as a basketball fan, I loved it. I and thought it was look, fun. They're, they're obviously going to be changes. Like this was always an organic thing that was going to grow and evolve. I can tell you that as we sit here recording this on Tuesday, there are meetings happening in the league office about how to evolve it autopsies being done postmortems being done about the in-season tournament like one suggestion i would make right off the bat don't hold the semifinals at 2 p.m local on a thursday like that <laughs> didn't, like i remember texting league officials i understand why the league did it because they want to do it on one day and, and if you could do it more like final I, four I get style all that, yeah but holding it at 2 p.m on thursday in an arena that was didn't seem full to me. Like I wasn't there, but didn't there was no energy in that building at all for Pacers against Bucks. That's something that needs to be cor corrected. Maybe you want to consider other options other than score differential uh, for you know for the next uh, iteration of it. If for no other reason than to stop getting like Billy Donovan pissed off about teams doing things to the Bulls over the course of the last month. So like th there are certainly tweaks that are going to be made, you know, to this format. But overall. It generated interest. I mean, the Ethan Strauss story, I, like I read it, it was good. He called it a flop. It's not a flop. Like, it's just like, it might not be as successful as some people out there are trumpeting it to be, but it absolutely is not a flop. It is absolutely something that the NBA can build on. And you know that just like the play-in tournament, it is here to stay. It's here to stay. That's exactly what I was going to say. Like, it's very clearly like, oh, the NBA is better with this. So let's keep tweaking it and making it work at that point. All right, Chris, I sincerely appreciate you giving us so much of your time. Did you have anything you wanted to plug? No, nope, but out if you're here? listening to this, make sure you subscribe to Boxing with Chris Mannix as well, which is all part of the old volume sports family. All right. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. Thank you all for listening and for supporting the show. As always, we will be back tonight to break down another jam-packed Tuesday night slate. I'll see you guys then.